Welcome everyone to APF's first Friday uh, of April 2023, and I'm very uh, delighted to introduce our guest speaker today, um, one of the winners of the IF Awards for last year. So we encourage you to take a look at the work that Dr. Ivana has uh, submitted, and she'll be talking more about it today, but you can definitely read more about it on um, her social media pages. So please allow me to introduce her. Dr. Ivana Miloyevich has a professional background in sociology, education, gender, peace, and future studies. She has held professorships at several universities and has introduced, designed, and taught university courses in Australia, at the University of Queensland and the University of the Sunshine Coast, in Serbia at the University of Novi Sad, and in Taiwan at Tam Kang University. Dr. Ivana is currently a director of metafuture.org and Metafuture School, as well as senior futures thinking and foresight specialist for the Asian Development Bank. She regularly runs workshops and writes reports based on clients' input working with various governmental and non-governmental organizations. She is also widely published in the area of future studies as well as gender and peace studies. Everybody, if you could please join me in welcoming Dr. Ivana, over to you. Thank you so much, thank you. It's lovely to see you all. Hi, Sohel, you're here too. As you can see, and probably like many of um, you, I wear many hats. And uh, today, this is a particular hat I've been wearing as well since forever. Um, it was always since I was very young, excited about stories, excited about narratives. I loved readings. When I would go uh, to children's parties, my mother was very worried about me, actually, <laughs> because I would go and hide in a corner to see like books that they had and I didn't. So this is something that I was always very passionate about reading. And then when I learned how to write about writing as well. So this is kind of um, not my day job, what uh, I would be presenting today, uh, because as uh, Nicole was saying, I do all these official foresight futures thinking workshops, presentations, report writing, research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but then I also do other stuff. Um, the, the futures work that I do as my day job, that's more with various organizations, um, ministries um, all around the world, and um, also a little bit with NGOs. So I've done work with non-governmental organizations because that was the background I came from. And uh, this project uh, that uh, I started has actually been around for a while, but because it was based in Serbia, it was not so widely known. We did uh, write my colleague and I who started the project, Alexandra Izgarian, a professor, Alexandra Izgarian from the University of Novi Sad. We started the project and we actually um, ran it in Serbia some time ago. We went to schools and uh, worked with libraries, but uh, we only published one article uh, in futures, and I have a link for that as well in my presentation. So that is something that was very kind of limited. And now, lately, a few years ago, I started uh, making it more available for wider audiences and for people who can access it without knowing Serbo-Croatian languages. Now there are multiple, there is not just one, because you know I was born in the former Yugoslavia, and now there are many countries uh, that came out of that one. So I would like to share screen. And uh, before I forget, because I may forget, and that wouldn't be good, I would first like to thank, um, sorry. I would like to first thank the judges. Thank you, judges. <laughs> oh, quit. It's quit. It's again quitting. Nicole. Okay. Would you like me to share my screen? Um. Yeah. That that would probably be better. Yes. Let's do it. Okay. That way.
Ivan, are you still there? She may have been disconnected by Zoom. She looks a bit frozen. All right, let's give her some time. Uh, I actually moved elsewhere, see whether that, this will be better because connection here may be a bit better. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And am I sharing the screen or that's you uh, sharing the that's screen? That's me. Would you like can to, I try try to share, to share your the screen, screen again? Yes. All right. Okay. Is it all good now? Yes, all good. And you can hear me. That's great. Okay, so what I want to, um, as I said, I want to thank the judges. Thank you so much. There are lovely comments by judges. They're available on the website, the Heroines Journey website, and uh, you can see what they had to say. I was very happy when I received them. Um, so I don't want to forget that. And of course, thank you all for being here uh, today. So that is my question, but we'll, because now there was a break in my Zoom, uh, input, we'll leave this uh, to the end because I would like to move just in case there are some other interruptions. I was really curious and maybe you can put that in a chat. Um, why are you here and, you know, whether you have any particular interesting topic and if so, you know, what exactly, any previous exposure, work. Uh, I know some of you, but I don't know everybody, and maybe you've done something similar, or um, you have you, you were inspired by something similar. So this is, I'll start with my story, and then maybe we will share other stories. As I said, I grew up in the former Yugoslavia, and as in any country, you are exposed to certain narratives. This is one particular narrative that I was exposed to when I was a child. It's a, a story that was part of our school curriculum. It still is in most countries of Southern and Southeast Europe. It's not so widely known in the Western Europe, but it is uh, widely known in Southeast Europe. And it's called The Building of Skadar. It's a longish story and uh, just to in a nutshell, to cut the long story short, basically it's about a young woman who becomes a mother and then um, her community, the king, his brothers, the builders, they're trying to build a castle, a Skadar on River Bojana. However, they are failing because whatever they build through the day is demolished throughout the night. So they can't figure out why this is happening. They're trying different things. They blame it on fairies, <laughs> feminine nature principle. This is my commentary now. And uh, whatever is being built through the day gets kind of demolished throughout the night. So they're thinking, how can they solve this problem? And once again, fast forward through multiple attempts, multiple strategies that they tried, the strategies that they finally chose and uh, that apparently worked was to wail in a new mother into the walls of Skadar of the building. So this young woman who was a mother was immured. So she was basically buried alive. And then a few last scenes were about her begging the builders to keep two openings in the walls, one for eyes and the other one for breasts because she had a baby and she wanted to nurse her baby. And she wanted to see when they're bringing her son to her and away uh, from her. So builders then had mercy on her and they did that. And apparently she nursed the boy, her son, for a year. And then she went silent. But the building stood. So this was the story that I was exposed to when I was young. And then I remember it being very traumatized for me. And there was no engagement in terms of what is this story about? Um, what's the purpose of this story? Why are you telling us this? Yes, we know it's part of our culture. It's part of our tradition. It's uh, written in a very beautiful poetic language. So we know all that, but why are you telling that to me? and other students in primary school, what's the purpose? There was no critical literacy around it. Certainly there was nothing about futures, ideas. How is that going to impact a young person like myself thinking about what's going to happen to her 
10 years or 20 years down the track if she does go that route of you know marrying and having children etc cetera, etc cetera. so many of those um how would i say messages were subtle very subtle and they were not to this day they're not recognized a um, few times I did this presentation in Serbia, there were some professors of literature that got really upset at me and they said, you did not understand the story. <laughs> I said, I think I understand it, but I understand it from a different perspective, different worldview. And this is what democratizing futures thinking is. Um, I would like to, because that's the topic of today's presentation, like to bring that in. Democratizing futures thinking is allowing for multiple perspectives to be shared heard, acknowledged, and then hopefully from there we develop more inclusive and more constructive narratives. Now, this is the story that, as I said, I was exposed to um, when I was very young, and um, it just was sitting with me for a while. And then I moved to Australia, and I was raising my own children in Australia. Now, I came from one culture, one language, one history into something completely else. And then I was... Um, kind of trying to embrace uh, everything that was around me. And amongst other things, I got best baby lullabies. Uh, Rockabye baby was one of them. Now, I have to say, because I didn't grow up in this um, cultural context, the first time I was uh, exposed to this story was when I was in my late 20s, when I had my babies. And uh, I was reading this story to them. So I didn't come from emotive uh, perspective. It wasn't something from my childhood that I would bring in and that I would just keep on repeating and enjoying because I enjoyed it when I was a child. Um, you know, my parents were telling me I was an outsider, so I only used my rational mind. And I was looking at the content of many of these lullabies and stories. And the Rockabye Baby, you probably know it because it's from um, kind of more global now tradition. It's a uh, rock by baby in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Down will come baby, cradle and all. So I was wondering, I was reading, why would you want to read this to your child before they go to sleep? <laughs> because to me, it was about, and we can have a discussion about this. Maybe it's about other things. Maybe again, I misunderstood what I was reading. But to me, it's a, a song about the baby plummeting to their death or risking serious injury. And it's something to, you know, like something you're supposed to do before they go to sleep. And then they go with those messages and have lovely dreams with their babies or something like that. Or, you know, there's a lot of debate here in terms of bringing such narratives to children, whether they're helpful or harmful. I were on the side of some of these narratives being harmful unless they're accompanied with critical literacy and futures literacy that you know about the implications and that you know about multiple meanings and symbolic meanings of this story and that you can also rewrite it so it works for you as well. Now, this is really important because uh, as um, some of the therapists like uh, White, uh, he's Australian, uh, Michael White, um, late therapist in the area of narrative therapy. He was writing about that and they developed a whole approach on narrative therapy. Um, so he did investigation a little bit about what those stories do to our psyche, what do they do to our psyche subconsciously. And so Hale, who is here today, can tell you as well, when we run workshops, because we run workshops from the area kind of applying narrative foresight. So we use lots of storytellers. So Hale, um, you know, started causal layer analysis, where one of the levels, if you know that method, is about myths and stories and narratives myths and metaphors, how do they impact on us? How do they impact on the work of organization, organizations, communities, societies, and also at individual level? So often when we do these processes, these workshops, and we ask people, what is your role in the organization? They come up with fairy tales. So when they go to that subconscious level of their mind, often they say, well, I feel like a Cinderella or I feel like an evil stepsister in this organization. So it's very fascinating how much impact stories we are raised with uh, from the very beginning have throughout our lives. 
As uh, White said, we are all active in passionate meaning makers. And we, when we come, when we are brought into this world, we are brought with the expectation of our arrival. So there is some sort of an expectation already a futures dimension. And then some of those expectations are placed on us and some of those narratives are placed on us. So we internalize them. And many people, like we had participants in workshops in their 50s and 60s, suddenly have a realization that they were living somebody else's story. That they were living internalized story that was not even theirs, that was kind of given to them, and they didn't question them and took them for granted, at least in one area of their life, not in all areas, but in one specific area, some stories that are no longer relevant or even harmful were still playing a role. So obviously all those narratives we inherit, and there is a difference here between a story and a narrative. Story is um, more narrow and it has beginning, middle and end. Uh, we know how stories end. Narratives are broader. They're like meta narratives are even broader. So they have this underlying message, a morale to the story that can be present in multiple stories. So you can have hundreds and hundreds of different stories that all share one similar or same narrative. If you look at science fiction, for example, there are many, many different stories there, but the narrative there uh, is very similar. There are some attempts to change those narratives, but they are very, when you look at the mainstream science fiction over a number of decades, and many people have done research on that, there are lots of books on that subject, you can see that the narrative is of a dystopian future. The narrative is of lots of conflict, lots of violent conflict, not enough nature, not enough human connection. So you can see that there are many different stories, hundreds and hundreds of science fiction stories, but they share the same narrative. And some of our colleagues who do research in the area of education have found out that some of those narratives are very disempowering for young people because they see dystopian futures. And in the present moment, there is not enough uh, motivation to, to do much, or they go into anxiety, depression, being fearful about the future, or being despondent because there is nothing much to hope for. And when you do some conversations around that with young people, very often their imagination of the future is coming from dominant mainstream science fiction or something else that they've been video games, something that they've been exposed to. As Daniel Ariely, another psychologist um, says, and behavioral economics person says, our imagination about the future are actually not very imaginative. They are very predictable. We are predictably irrational. We are irrational, but we are predictably irrational. So some of those narratives keep on coming back and they keep on impacting us off uh, that subconscious level. Everything we are exposed to in our life, uh, all sorts of historical, social, cultural, and fam family influences play a role. Our own personality plays a role, how sensitive are we are, how neurodiverse we are, uh, which gender we are. You know, lots of factors play a role in terms of how we, as young people, and then later throughout our life, are going to take those narratives in, and then what are we going to do with them? Um, now, peace educator Jessica Senehi made a really good distinction in terms of all these narratives, and she argued that not all narratives are same, equal, or valuable, that we have destructive narratives uh, and constructive narratives. Uh, I'm personally much more interested in constructive narratives, which are inclusive, which are about uh, fostering shared power, which are open for dialogue, insight, bringing some of those subconscious issues that uh, I was talking about into consciousness, into awareness, because it's only there and then that you can actually do something about it. And they can be helpful to establish uh, better societies, to establish uh, those utopias. Um, hero journey, heroine's journey. Okay, so there's some perennial qualities of a good story, and Joseph Campbell has done lots of work around that. He's talked, and there's some more kind of elaborate um, steps here in terms of how stories begin, how they develop, how they end. He talked about the hero's, hero's journey, and it's very interesting. You know, his work is fantastic and uh, kind of used. Uh, 
Campbell's uh, work quite a bit in some other parts of uh, our work as well. At the same time, and this is citation from Maureen Murdoch's book, Heroine's Journey, when they ask him like, okay, so these are heroes journey, what about heroines? And uh, his response was that heroines actually don't journey. <laughs> His response was that in the whole mythological tradition, the woman is simply there. Girl is, a, is there, a woman is there. She's a, like a, almost like a passive object. And all she has to do is to realize that she's the place that people are trying to get to. When a woman realizes what her wonderful character is, she's not going to get messed up with the notion of being pseudo male. And that is something I find very interesting because obviously from a different perspective and a different gaze, I too journey throughout my life. And as far as I know, most women also journey throughout their lives. Uh, and uh, that journey is sometimes being forced to become pseudo male because of the way our societies are structured. And if you look at the liberation of many heroines in let's say Disney movies, they've been liberated from being passive objects, but the only way they can now achieve fame is through embracing masculine symbol of power, which is violence. So lots of characters get swords, they're slaying dragons, they're going on adventures, but they're using violence as a means of conflict transformation, which I would like to argue is uh, something that is being brought in through um, kind of patriarchal worldview in many ways. So this is one option, and we can see what heroine's journey is according to Disney, something that many of us grew up with and uh, younger generations are growing up as well. There's some attempts to change this meta narrative. So as I said, these are all individual stories, but there is an underlying narrative as uh, many theories talk about in most of these stories, and this is now putting a different perspective, um, men, are those that are heroes, but they're also um, violent subjects and objects, while women are supposed to be beauty objects or a beauty and sex objects. So this is kind of in patriarchal template, this is how narratives, meta-narratives operate. The stronger the patriarchy, the stronger that meta-narrative, the more gender equality, the more that narrative is being change, transform, challenge, and so on. So uh, Maureen Murdoch has come up with her own template of the heroine's journey, which she talked about heroine's journey uh, sort of path. And uh, I read her book and I was kind of not 100% sold because the goal at the end is integration of masculine and feminine. While the hero comes back from his journey into community and offers transformation, because he's transformed in the process, he offers some sort of a transformation uh, to the community, heroine is staying still within herself, and there is that integration of masculine and feminine within her. So she still stays in a private sphere of her own mind, of her own influence of family as well. Now, uh, as uh, Nicole was saying, my background is in sociology as well. It is in education, in sociology. So I'm always interested in looking at how do we transform ourselves, but also look at social change parallel to personal transformation. Uh, now, in terms of futures, images, and visions, I already mentioned that. And I would just like to add that you can look at some of those images as simply fun. You know, it's a science fiction, you go there, there is something moving, there is action, and you just uh, go through the experience, you just have, it's just some entertainment and fun, which would be fine if we had different types of stories and narratives, and we do, but they're marginalized. The dominant stories are the ones that uh, are, I already uh, said what they are, and uh, you can see it visually in this um, corner, left, bottom. So no fantasy is actually ideologically an innocent text. There is always that litany of a story that is informed by deep narratives, deep cultural stories, archetypes, uh, myths, metaphors, and particular worldviews. It's always a particular worldview that is behind that. So if you see that there is an 
common narrative throughout hundreds and thousands of stories and comes from one particular cultural framework and comes from one particular worldview in terms of our gendered experiences of the world, you know that um, there is something that some theories call colonization of the future. And to decolonize the future, we need to incorporate different narratives, metaphors, myths, storylines, and definitely different worldviews. Whether those different worldviews are coming from different gendered experiences or different cultural experiences. Futures thinking as well, um, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but my perception is that uh, when we do futures thinking, it's mostly in this official world um, with organizations, with corporations, sometimes we go to schools, but it's not democratized at the level of mainstream society. And certainly young people are quite passive. I know there are lots of colleagues of ours, Adam Sharp, who works with us with, um, through Meta Future School. He does a lot about young people's foresight and uh, th there are many, of our colleagues and organizations that focus on that, trying to empower new generation of foresight practitioners or trying to empower young people to create their own desired futures, to create their own narratives, to create their own storylines, because obviously whatever we give them from different generational uh, perspective is not going to be so democratic, <laughs> especially if it's this top-down approach. So empowering young people through democratizing futures thinking, I think, is uh, very critical and crucial. Um, there is, um, at this stage, not too much money in this. I mean, most futurists who make money work for corporations, work for big organizations, and that's my day job and not so day job, okay? So that sort of how the system works in my experience. To, uh, to bring it down to three main points that I wanted to kind of my main argument here today is that we, if we want to democratize futures and democratize futures thinking, we need to make that futures thinking, especially critical futures thinking, more widely available and accessible for younger people. That's the first point. The second point is uh, to democratize futures, there should be some sort of decolonizing, decolonization happening here because uh, futures has been colonized by high tech, by particular cultural frameworks, by patriarchy. Mary Daly talked about that in 1970s about uh, colonization of even outer space and uh, you know future by patriarchy, but as well with certain cultural frameworks, what is the purpose of next step and the one after. So decolonizing the, those dominant narratives where futures kind of equates technological advancement, for example, that's the big one. Or where futures is advanced in the area of technology, but there is status quo for gender relationships, existing cultural frameworks, violent conflict resolution. They all stay unchallenged in so many ways because they all follow a particular meta-narrative and they all come from a particular worldview that informs those discourses. So if we want to democratize futures thinking a little bit more, we need to look at those underlying assumptions, underlying meta-narratives, challenge them, critique them, but then at the same time transform them, being informed by different perspectives and different lived experiences. And third point is, that is really relevant to democratize futures thinking through making it available in local places and local languages because they become more culturally relevant, which is why um, we kind of, uh, when I did this project, we started in a local language and local culture. And uh, some of those stories were culturally relevant and, and they may not be translatable. We can translate words, but we cannot translate cultural context and historical context. So I'm a big believer that some of that work needs to happen um, in places that uh, have different contexts, historical and cultural. Now, in terms of narrative foresight, which is the approach uh, we use through MetaFuture, kind of uh, meta future. Sorry, I'm just checking to see what time uh, in terms of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so a narrative approach is, uh, narrative foresight is the approach we use a lot. We use uh, that approach in working with, as I said, in our day job, with uh, working with organizations, corporations, and so on, but also in other projects. And that approach is to critically, it's in the tradition of critical futures thinking, it's in a tradition of future studies, not so much in a tradition of strategic foresight. But even when we do strategic foresight projects, we kind of bring this a little bit into the picture. Um, from the side, you know, because of who we are. So narrative foresight focuses on critically evaluating existing and simultaneously creating new futures narratives. And those new futures narratives ideally are aligned with uh, constructive storytelling as defined by Senehi and others. Here are some links. If you want to check some of those articles I was referring to, they're all, I believe, freely available. Uh, some of those articles um, that are uh, describing what narrative foresight is, and then describing a particular project that I will tell you a little bit more about that I've done um, in Serbia, creating alternative futures through storytelling, and also all this psychological stuff that I refer to. That's in an article, Constructing Alternative Selves, the Use of Futures Discourse in Narrative Therapy. So you can access them. As I said, they're all freely available. Um, journal of Future Studies in an open source journal, and um, I think you can find the other ones there. Now, it's critically important, as I said, uh, when we engage in these processes to, yes, bring things into awareness, maybe do a critique, but also, as Elizabeth Gross, the philosopher, said, to say something is not true, valuable, or useful without posing alternatives, which is what futures thinking is in a nutshell is paradoxically to affirm that it is true and so on. Thus, coupled with this negative project of challenging what currently exists, or rather indistinguishable from it, must be a positive constructive project creating alternatives. That's very interesting in terms of how our mind works. The more we critique something, the stronger it becomes. The more we say that something is not something, that's all people think about. It's a classic, um, do not think about white elephant. Uh, metaphor, because the minute you say, do not think about white elephant, that's all you think about. So it's important to talk about the white elephant, say, oh, there is a white elephant, this big meta narrative in the room. It's called patriarchy, or it's called cultural imperialism, or colonization, or racism, or nationalism, or uh, white privilege, or maybe some other type of privilege. You know, there is a white elephant in the room, so we can acknowledge it. But then it's equally important to see, is there something better that we can design? Maybe this uh, has a role, or this has a role so far working for whatever reason, but is there something better? And then focus on that, acknowledge and move on, and then put energies into creating alternatives rather than constantly critiquing something, which is what lots of social movements have been doing for quite some time. And uh, because I operate, I worked in those spaces and came from those spaces, it became a little bit tiring and thus futures thinking was very liberating for me because you focus on alternatives, you focus where you want to go. You say there are these multiple options, from there I'm going to focus not what people are telling me is the future, I'm going to focus on what I consider my preferred future and then align my strategies and activities in the present moment to go there rather than towards the future I do not want. It's very common, people very frequently come up with vision of the future, which is not in alignment with their strategy. Uh, from Russia not wanting NATO near their borders to some organizations we worked with that have a vision of environmentally sustainable society, but then fund uh, how many kilometers of the roads are being, you know, concreted. So the strategy and the vision are not in alignment. Uh, so I think the role of narrative force and the role of critical futures thinking, the role of future studies and thinking in general is to make that alignment between multiple options, investigate and put them all out into the open, democratize futures thinking from the future. This is the future that everybody has to adjust to. Uh, everybody has to agree that that's the future. And then we go into that direction 
on all of us, which happens a lot, happens a lot in the area of education. I mean, I've written quite a bit about that in Educational Futures book by Rutledge that was published some time ago. I've written about this disconnect between a vision and the strategy in several pieces on futures fallacies. They're also freely available. So how do we bring that? How do we kind of uh, get from this one approach, there is the future, you have to adjust to it, to say, okay, there are multiple options. And then from these multiple options, you choose the preferred and then align your strategies and your actions in the present moment towards that vision, because that's more likely um, going to succeed in terms of getting you the future you want rather than the one you don't want that you keep on critiquing. Uh, having said all this, I just want to briefly mention um, a, a disease that I feel is common in our field because I overview uh, for several, um, I, I review for some futures journals and, uh, you know, the, for conferences, et cetera, et cetera. There is something called the first, the best, and the only syndrome where people come up with things and they claim they're the first, the best, and the only. Uh, what I've done uh, is not the first, the best, and the only syndrome. And actually nothing we do is part of that because there's always rich tradition of something. There is tradition of thinking along these lines that came before us. We kind of, may, we update it, we make some links and connections. Sometimes we come up with things that are novel, but even when we come up with things that are novel, that's based on works of many, 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 many people that came before us. So this is just one example. Um, people that were doing similar type of work and similar projects. It's called Positively Mother Goose by Lumens and others. And they have taken those nursery rhymes and they said, well, okay, let's see if we can turn it into something different. Uh, rock by baby on the treetop when the wind blows the cradle will rock. Birdies and squirrels will be at play and you can watch them all through the day. So it's a narrative that falls into more of that constructive storytelling. And they have a whole wonderful book with wonderful illustrations on that. Uh, there are many, many, there are thousands of books uh, that do the same thing, uh, that are trying to rewrite the dominant meta narrative and come up with more constructive storytelling. So you move away from giving the message, underlying message of world being scary, unsupportive, anything can happen and adults may leave children by themselves in conditions that will cause them to get hurt to some different types of messages as we've seen in the previous example. In European and uh, Serbian uh, tradition, history, cultural context, which is what I'm mostly familiar with, and this is why I do work in those areas. I do work in the areas that I know kind of best about. Uh, I have a book called Breathing Violence In, Violence Out, which is looking at um, intergenerational trauma, which is looking at uh, the impact of wars and violence throughout many generations, so long-term impact. And that uh, book is based on something that my family of origin went through. And just two weeks ago, somebody was reading that book and says, why don't you use the same thing for current conflict in Ukraine? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I didn't respond, but I was thinking, well, because, you know, I don't sit there and, uh, you know, I would come there as an outsider. And I think there are a whole set of problems uh, if you do something like that. So democratizing futures is also about bringing multiple perspectives from people who are being theorized or who are being understood or whose stories are being interpreted one way or another. So to properly hear them, you need to democratize it in a way that you engage with active listening and uh, you allow for those perspectives and worldviews to come into the play as well. In any case, there are certain stories that I came up with and future is Ryan Eisler, uh, who if you know, talks about partnership society versus dominator society, similarly to what Elise Balding, peace uh, theorist and futurist as well, talked about the coming of the gentle society, or James Robinson about she and he future, saying humane ecological versus hyper expansionist. So those are some ideas that have been around for quite some time, for decades, and they inspired me and they informed me. So there's, as I said, a rich tradition of 
people that were already doing this type of work. And you can have some, uh, you, you can have a look on um, tales, MetaFuture tales um, site. There is a whole section, a whole page on those type of inspirations. But basically, Ryan Eisler was doing a critique and she developed partnership education models where she was saying that in many traditional European tales, and obviously, you know, that's a part of the Yugoslav cultural historical context as well as Serbian, and as expressed in those folklore stories, songs, proverbs, and fairy tales, humans are portrayed as bad, cruel, violent, and selfish. And uh, they are kind of full of cruelty, trickery, and violence, including violence against women, children, and those that are deemed different, which are in contradiction to the other messages parents and students communicate to children, especially to be good and kind, nonviolent, and giving. So it's important to address that contradiction, and it's important to develop alternative narratives that are more constructive in creating futures the way we want them to be created. There's lots of violence in stories, um, and we can have a whole session on whether that's psychologically helpful or harmful. I'm going to skip that. But basically, if you come from a perspective that that's psychologically harmful because it impacts us on a psychological subconscious level, I believe that because I've seen what happens to people when they're confronted with wars and violence, how some of those narratives from 14th century become suddenly important. Uh, some of those past destructive narratives start playing out. In terms of conflict resolution, people keep on going back to Second World War, even though our societies have changed big time. But then you hear narratives, they only understand violence, you have to really suppress them. So there is a whole range of narratives out there that are very influential, but they come from the past. And it comes from the past that I believe is destructive. It's not learning from the past. It's actually making sure you repeat it. So when we look at these stories um, and uh, we want to do a small, tiny little project with uh, children, with young people in schools, in our local environment, in libraries, and so on and so forth, we can utilize possible strategies. We can just use completely new and contemporary stories, remove from curriculum stories which promote violence, gender, and cultural stereotypes. As you would very well know, that's very difficult because people would then accuse you of cance uh, cancel culture and whatnot. And also it is part of historical tradition. Another approach which many people have been doing is to retell the traditional widely known stories. And I think that's brilliant actually, because if you take uh, from a perspective of futures thinking, if you take an old tale and write something else, then you immediately have two options. So immediately you work towards developing alternatives, which is what futures thinking in a nutshell at some level is. Uh, and then you don't have the explicit critique, which is always about bring strife, kind of accentuates conflict. Once you go into that, oh, well, I'm critiquing and then people become defensive and then you critique more and then people double down. But you do implicit, very gentle critique of something that is less desirable. And then at the same time, you provide alternatives and then people can choose. They can choose what works for them, what speaks to them. If it doesn't speak to them, that's fine. We again have that situation in our workshops uh, happen a lot when people do not want scenarios that the main group or desired preferred vision that a uh, group was developing, then you gently move them to something and validate their perspective and develop yet another scenario and so on and so forth. So there is implicit critique, explicit description of desired ways of behaving out there for people to take it or leave it. And then there is a promotion of critical literacy among children in the process, promotion of dialogue. The final, the best part of this is asking children then, which is what we've done in the project, to write their own stories. So they were the, as I said, um, our imaginations of the future, psychologists find, are not very imaginative. We keep on recreating what we know. And it's very hard to break some modes unless we see something else, unless we see alternatives. So the minute you have two, and, and the more the merrier. If you have multiple, that's even better. But the, media, uh, the minute you have two, you're then empowered 
to not keep on recreating status quo, not keep on saying, well, this is how it's always been. You have freedom to create something else. So we provided alternative stories. Everybody knows the traditional ones. Everybody knows about the Cinderella Sleeping Beauty, the way it's been written by Grimm Brothers and Anderson and uh, you know, made into visual media through Disney. So everybody knows that, so you don't have to really spend much time there. You provide an alternative and then you invite young people to create their own narratives and their own stories. And because we work with various age groups, we had children that were using artwork and not everybody is into writing. So some people were doing embodied things like drama skits uh, or they were drawing or they were just having uh, some sort of fun kind of events that they created with the help of their teachers or uh, librarians. Now, this is the project uh, that we've done in Serbia and the book. Book also had a workbook at the end, which was really helpful to teachers and to parents because they were saying, you know, we know we want something else. Like there's lots of violence in post-conflict societies. So they say, we really want something else. We just don't know how to, and curriculum and ministry and everybody is telling us we should be doing all these things, but we actually don't know how to do that. We don't have the skills. And sometimes what we are doing is having a counter effect. It's creating lots of strife. It's creating lots of kind of um, conflict because people are comfortable with what they know. Storytelling as a method, as a tool, as an educational method and tool is very powerful, it's flexible, it's accessible, and it's also not expensive. You know, you can do it in places that are not uh, wealthy. If done constructively, can be utilized in creating alternative futures and some of those desired improved futures that we are talking about, preferred futures. Another thing when we democratize storytelling as well, it's uh, in this way where, where young people are invited to become authors of their own meta narratives, authors of their narratives. They will always be an author of their own story, but we want them to be authors of their narratives as well, which are really much larger. And sometimes we are not aware that there is an alternative because we are surrounded with a dominant narrative in a particular society so much that we can't know that there is a possibility of something else. Through these alternative retellings, uh, you, you engage in a method that is more indirect and respectful rather than prescriptive and didact uh, didactic. What's the term? Didactic, didactic, sorry. Method of teaching and engaging and uh, active participation of youth in this process is um, very critical where they can create their own pneumatology rather than keep on being passive recipients of social kind of media or, you know, they, they are more and more creators. But the question is when they create this content, is it still based on dominant narratives, dominant meta narratives, or they're really truly engaging with something qualitatively not quantitatively, qualitatively different. These are some of the common themes in uh, Serbian folk tales, uh, women being from, from the perspective of Campbell and Heron's journey, um, the way he was talking about, he would be right there because women are passive. Uh, they're sometimes, if they're active, they're immediately evil. Um, if they age, they're immediately evil. <laughs> You know, there is always, uh, you know, there is violence um, and, and most commonly they are nameless. So in this project, because of my childhood trauma, we were really keen and we wrote two stories. My colleague Alexandra is better than myself. Two stories where we liberated woman who was uh, immersed into the walls of the castle. And we gave her a name as well, Slobodanka, which is a common Slavic name meaning freedom conveniently. So then, uh, you know, we created a different narrative around this topic. It started the same, but ended very differently. So we did the construction, which is about violence, the story based on a particular worldview and perspective that I carry um, is about violence against women, victimization of women. And there are some other narratives um, around loyalty, honesty, and so on and so forth. And then we've done reconstruction where that woman 
that in the traditional destructive storytelling tradition was severely disempowered and in the end killed and tortured. Uh, we gave her political and economic power, power through education, supportive family relationships, and uh, she actually solves the problem of building, crumbling throughout the night, but through very, very different strategies and very different means, as most heroines do. You know, they don't resort to violence, they do something else. Um, there is another story, which is about um, Alice in Wonderland. So there is no queen that's, who is older and evil by definition, you know, who is asking people to, for their heads to be chopped off. But there is a nonviolent conflict resolution and transformation. Um, so I, I'm into that. I teach conflict transformation courses online. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is a story. There, there were 10 stories in that book and then a workbook, how to work with traditional stories stories, traditional narratives, new ones, and how to invite students, how to invite children to become creators of their own narratives. Um, this is the project. It's an educational initiative that is really about strengthening progressive and social inclusive futures. It's about constructive storytelling, focusing on using local knowledge and language, deconstructing and reconstructing those master narratives through telling alternative stories. You can read all about it on the website if you're interested. But this is basically, in a nutshell, one attempt to somewhat a little bit in small ways in one small environment democratize futures thinking in a very concrete way and i have to tell you that hundreds and hundreds of uh, children went through that and some really had very nice things to say you know in terms of how much they themselves felt they didn't use the word empowered but that's basically what it was they felt that they now can do something that makes sense rather than be on autopilot doing repetitive behavior that doesn't make sense, like going to a playground and being tough and beating everybody. They had suddenly a choice where they could do something else. At this stage, uh, I mean, there, are, uh, there is a book with 10 stories and workbook in Serbian. And then there are now three books in English. I hope that that will expand. I would really love to see expansion throughout places, cultures, languages, uh, different authors as well. I can only do as much as I can as a one person. So if you have any ideas in this respect, uh, go have a look at the site. And uh, the links are available in the PowerPoint presentation that Nicole will kindly make available to everybody. So you can have a look. And if you have any ideas, please uh, let me know. And maybe we co-design something else or something uh, continue. Um, so far, three books uh, are publishing the series uh, to democratize the form. There is ebook, there is paperback, and there is hard copy. Uh, hard copy looks like this. I don't know whether you can see it. And then there is a paperback, and you can, it's print on demand to make it more uh, environmentally kind of <laughs> friendly so that we don't print big. Uh, big copies, but it's uh, printed on demand, but there's also an ebook. And uh, The Future Maker is in a nutshell, I mean, it's a story uh, and it's inspired by the Greek story of Cassandra. So you would know that story if you're in the area of futures thinking, you would know about that story about a young woman who is warning about impending dangers, but no one believe her because she's cursed. There is a little bit of Norse mythology. There is a little bit about uh, work of and life of generations of environmentalists, including uh, Greta Thunberg. And uh, then it ends with an invitation to move from a dystopian towards alternative futures. It even talks a little bit about mental health, but without talking about mental health. OK, so none of these terms, these are our technical terms. And we use them in our area of uh, formal work, but when you're working with younger people, you need to get away from that jargon. So you have to get, uh, you know, to talk about it through different ways. So I don't mention this terminology. I'm just giving you an overview, summarizing that this particular book, The Future Maker, is an invitation for young people to move from certain dystopian visions towards alternative futures and start creating something else. The gold maker is also inspired by 
uh, various stories from European and Serbian tradition. And then it ends up with an invitation in envisioning utopia, utopia, better society, not perfect one, a new golden age. It's actually also about feminist economics, <laughs> but I, I don't mention, as I said, uh, those terms. It's just a different worldview that informed me, that then informed uh, the narrative that is present in this book. And the final one is The Peacemaker. It's uh, based on the story I told you about that is also in a Serbian version, um, inspired by Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Samurai and the Monk, Tale of Two Wolves, Slavic mythology, and the work of generations of peace thinkers and activists that came before me. And there is an invitation there to learn how to develop futures, wheels, and scenarios be, without calling them that. So it's talking about implications of conflict, you know, what can happen if you go this way or you go that way. There are four scenarios that are not called scenarios. They're called uh, movies. There is a very scary movie, less scary movie, strange words movie, and uh, one more that I can't remember right now. But uh, yeah, so those, uh, uh, you know, democratizing futures thinking also means changing our vocabulary a little bit when we are working with different groups. Um, yeah, a very scary movie, a less scary movie, this or that movie, and strange words movie. So those are basically four scenarios, but I don't call them that. To conclude, um, this project is about playing with images of the future in many ways and utilizing them as agents of social change, um, utilizing them through progressive story, uh, constructive storytelling for progressive futures that would benefit many of us and certainly undo those hierarchies that we inherited. And hopefully those stories for people who access them um, can be some very practical places as uh, Frank Hutchinson has written in his book, Educating Beyond Violent Futures, where we, they can begin their practical journeys of hope. So that's that, that's our time. And uh, for my presentation, oh, there are comments. And uh, yeah, I would, I, Nicole, you want to take over? I don't think I, I can read everything now in a second. Oh, um, so people were giving comments about how um, even a child's prayer, I, I'm familiar with this uh, when you were talking about uh, the Rockabye Baby Lullaby and how it's about a child falling to their death. And this one prayer, um, I was taught this as a child, I was raised Catholic, and it ends with, and now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and it ends with, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, so <laughs> it's a little bit dark. <laughs> and, and that's fair enough, you know, so there is, as I said, there is a debate that some of those uh, violent narratives in stories are helpful to young people because they can work through their fears. But if you don't give them alternative, if you don't allow them critical literacy, if you don't allow them critical future thinking uh, and give them skills and tools for that, I think people get stuck in lots of fear, lots of anxiety, lots of depression. And we know that from psychological research, we know that from recent events, uh, what has happened in Australia, for example, I think it's now 50% of young people suffer from anxiety and depression or struggle with anxiety. That's huge. That's every second person that's been ascertained as having issues around anxiety and depression. And given the narratives that are around in terms of how bleak the future is, I don't think that comes as a surprise in terms of the societies we are creating more and more so that are more and more hierarchical, more unequal, more, you know, there, there are all those issues that are very difficult to address. So even when you engage in some of the progressive narratives and try to solve those problems, if you keep on focusing on the problem, it, it, without giving solution, I'm not saying we don't need to focus on the problem, of course we do, but if you don't provide an alternative, which is what futures thinking is about, then people can get uh, stuck, yeah? Especially young people. Yeah, I, because I think, yeah, I told you, I worked eight months as a counselor in a school. And, oh my God, I, I think the lockdown had such a big impact on them that 
it's like when you talk about so what would you like to do in the future there's no future and i heard mm -hmm. it that many times that it was actually scary mm, yeah yeah so i, I think, think we have responsibility i do believe as futurists we have a responsibility to provide some alternatives to help with these narratives and say well yes and dystopia has a role to play we need to come up with dystopian images because we know from let's say futures fallacies research have done that people have this uh, uh, fallacy of personal exemption so they see the future is going badly but personally they think that they will be okay you know, like the whole society will collapse and climate and everything, but my personal future will be good. I will still have a job, a family, a car, a house, et cetera, et cetera. So there is once again a disconnect there. So I think it's important to base our knowledge, you know, on what's real, evidence-based, using dystopia in a way to sometimes maybe tell people, well, if you, we continue with status quo, no change scenario or marginal change, this is a likely outcome. But then dystopia can become a very powerful narrative that unless given utopian, utopian and even utopian versions, you know, people can get very disempowered. Like why bother every action in the present moment has to come up with some sort of an image of the future that inspires us. And it's better if that inspiration comes from good positive places than places we fear, especially once, I said, once again, uh, that's especially important for young people. We have a question here, um, Ivana. How much psychology and marketing are in narrative foresight? I'm getting this question quite recently quite frequently? Uh, well, in terms of psychology and marketing, uh, I've done quite a bit of myself, quite a bit of research in psychology. And uh, I know Sohail, uh, who, Sohail Inayatullah, who is also here, who is, um, you know, we do it through metafuture.org. He's done quite a bit. We understand marketing. <laughs> we had to learn it. I came from a socialist country into a capitalist country. I had to learn a lot about it. That doesn't mean I'm comfortable with it, um, but um, you know, it's something that we learn. We know how those things operate, but we are not, that's not our thing really. Uh, so yes, we do our best because our background is academic. We do our best to whatever we are doing to make informed decision, evidence-based, look at research, look at how research is being done. There is quite a bit of psychological research. And in terms of marketing, I'm not so keen on marketing because marketing is about convincing people that they need something that they may or may not. Uh, but there is behavioral economics that is very interesting that bridges those two fields, economics, marketing. And so you can use it as Foucault was saying, you can use any discourse, anything you can use for multiple purposes. So behavioral economics, you can use to enhance your marketing strategy, or you can use to get more insight into human condition and actually empower yourself not to fall victim of marketing attempts to part you with your money for purchasing things you don't want or need. So you know, there is lots of research out there. And yes, when we do our stuff, we kind of look at that, but that's not our expertise per se. Anything yeah. else? We have another we have question. Then. Okay. If you still have time, Ivana. Yeah, I, I have time. I just oh. uh, don't know about your setup and I have time. I'm here, okay. yeah. Uh, this other question, uh, when engaged or involved in narrative foresight, would you say magic happens once in a meditative, me meditative state? Yeah, I've seen that many times. I've seen that many times, especially the way Sohail runs it. He runs people through personal futures and he runs them through inner CLA, inner conflict transformation, uh, uh, sorry, inner CLA causal layer analysis process. Um, and, uh, you know, we had people in workshops cry and, uh, you know, really get uh, very emotional. And uh, 
and also free. I know when I was teaching university courses, I would get lots of um, undergraduate students, so young, youngish in Australia, 17 to 20, 21. That's the cohort mainstream. I mean, there are obviously mature age students as well, but they would really come up and say that they felt empowered by this. When we did the project in uh, Serbia, we, get, we got, I mean, one of the, just to bring it down to a micro level now, there was one, a young girl, she was in primary school and she wrote the letter to her brother. You know, they were fighting a lot. They had so much conflict. They were beating each other up. And then she went through this process and saw that you don't have to do it like that. You can resolve conflict differently. You don't always have to engage in, uh, you know, there are other possibilities. So she actually wrote this very touching letter to her brother talking about her transformation and her commitment to different type of relationship. The peacemaker is a little bit about that. It's about two sisters fighting and then uh, having a very lovely <laughs> resolution at the end, I think. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, um, so I've seen it. I actually seen some profound change happens because we are working with meta narratives and deep narratives that many of us are not even aware of. When I was growing up, I was not aware of, like I wanted to, like if you ask me what do you want from life, I wanted the the the. And then it hit me many years, many decades later that what I wanted was exactly what my mother had. I have friends who tell me, you know, they go shopping for one thing and then suddenly see all these things that they need and want, that they didn't need and want before they went to a store. So as humans, our mind works like that. Unless we're exposed to other things, uh, whether it's ideas or it's physical object or it's experience, Unless we are exposed to multiple kind of things out there, phenomena out there, which is why some of our colleagues do experiential futures work. And we obviously through workshops, we do quite a bit of that embodied, you know, moving through space, uh, not just being here, but do, using different modes of knowing. So when they're exposed to diversity, then I think only then you can make an informed decision for yourself. Otherwise, there is this repetition and there is internalized all sorts of stuff that we are not even aware that we internalize. Um, I know people who to this day have certain expectations be based on the past, even though society has changed, even though environment has changed, but we carry some expectations from our childhood that we internalize. So futures thinking is about change, social, cultural, technological, you know, we look at that, we look at emerging issues, we look at trends, and we look how society is changing, but sometimes we don't look at how we are not changing. <laughs> you know, society, external environment is changing, but we are not necessarily changing. And this is a way to bridge some of that disconnect between vision and strategy in the present moment, external, internal, macro, micro, and so on and so forth. Oh, that's great. Stories from the Arab culture. That would be beautiful. Uh, introducing foresight to individuals and organizations in the Middle East. That's fantastic. And I mean, there is a common story, again, talking about heroines. There is a woman who saves her life by telling stories. She did not resort to violence. She did not grab a sword, but she saved her life because King wanted to get rid of her after one night or something like that. She was telling stories. I think it comes from Arab culture, but I'm not entirely sure. She was telling all those stories, 100, 100 stories she told that saved her life, basically. So she used different type of power, different type of power than the sword. And I think that's a brilliant story that shows heroine's journey and in a way does implicit critique of Joseph Campbell, who says that women do not journey. <laughs> women do journey, but in, in different ways. And people from different cultural backgrounds journey in different ways than dominant culture, whether it's global or local. So I think, yeah, Shirzad, thank you so much reminding me. So yes, she was brilliant. She was brilliant. She was in uh, somebody who was in a very, 
and actually these stories that I, uh, three that are now in English, they all, all women in those stories deal with some sort of a power, male power and violence. They need to somehow find ways to overcome it through nonviolent ways. So Shirzad is one excellent example, and uh, it would be brilliant if something around that and future thinking and foresight could be brought, uh, you know, in, into the open, more explicit. So Heba, I kind of believe in you. <laughs> I hope, <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear if you manage to actually get into more, more of that work. It would be fantastic. Yeah. As I was uh, listening to your presentation, Ivana, I was thinking about um, the fairy tales that I used to grow up on and what they taught me. And I suddenly have this question that I need to find the answer to. Um, how do fairy tales or children's stories differ um, between the countries with the highest happiness index? Maybe they're teaching their children more about contentment. Um, I'm not sure what kind of values they impart, but um, growing up on, on stories that taught me that kindness is usually taken for granted or people take advantage of you if you're kind or you have to be competitive with one another to yeah. get on top or get ahead like it makes so much sense sense that this is the world that we have right now if that's the the myth and metaphor that we were taught to believe in at such an early age yes and just for fun i worked with one ministry of education and they had this white paper uh, it was in Australia, one area, one ministry in Australia, because there are six states here. And I had this white paper and it was all about like, there is on the first page, like 20 times it was competition. Like we are going to create education so that children in the future can compete and compete and compete and compete. So just to mess with them a little bit, uh, I ask, uh, okay, so what happens if we win and they lose? What happens to them? And it was just like, it's because the narrative is so strong and it is within the context of nation state. It's not context of, even though they talk about globalization, but it was in the context of globalization that you have to compete and the children need to be kind of um, develop skills to compete. So it was all from that one particular worldview. And you look at the curriculum across the board, it's all the same narrative. So there is no different alternative narrative there that is not based on competition, for example. So exactly what you're saying. So many of those stories are still very powerful. They're still out there. And uh, as I said, we can try to like engage in some sort of a dialogue, hoping that destructive storytelling minimizes and constructive storytelling is enhanced. I'm hoping that a movie comes out of this, Ivana, or a video game uh, instead of <laughs> Hunger Games. <laughs> that, that would be lovely. That would be fun. Well, that's another one. And I read yesterday that on Netflix, uh, this, the show that got 100 out of 100 on something Rotten Tomatoes or something, it's called Beef. And it's about two people in the US, Korean background, I think, who, yeah, Beef, yeah. And uh, they want to destroy each other. It's about anger and it's about, I mean, I just looked at that and it's the most watched show. Uh, it's the, something that got 100 out of 100 of Netflix, which obviously, you know, we have the need for some of those stories, but then because they're so dominant, we don't know how to behave differently. It's very difficult. So when we get triggered, we go into those type of behaviors. It's about road rage. It starts as road rage and then becomes something else. It's my understanding from what I read. So it would be nice to get stories where you have still have some action, you still have some journey, but that journey is based on more constructive narratives rather than trying to destroy the other. Yeah. Thank you, Bessir, for your suggestion. 
Yeah, that would be lovely, Nicole. <laughs> if anybody has resources, because I'm spent, <laughs> you know, just doing these three books was uh, trying to figure out Ingram Spark and print on demand and working with graphic designers. And, you know, like, oh, well, I'm spent for a little while. So uh, at least for a year or two. And also, I have to do my day job to uh, uh, earn to be able to fund all these things. Uh, so if anybody has any resources and ideas or, you know, something that, that would be lovely. That would be lovely to co-partner, co-author, co-design, create something completely different or develop. And we do have one colleague in Germany, Elizabeth. She is actually wanting to get a book on narrative foresight that is more like a comic book, but not quite. I don't know. We are meeting uh, with her. We'll be in Europe in, uh, over summer, so European summer. So we'll meet with her and see what she intends to do. So that would be fantastic because as I said, in terms of democratizing futures, that is a uh, approach. That is approach. This is a little bit of an old medium kind of static books. Uh, medium I'm comfortable with because of my generational thing. Uh, but there are other mediums, the moving mediums, the you know, visual, this is also visual because it has illustrations, but also different type of visual and uh, you know, TikToks and you know whatnot. That would, you know, that would be fantastic if you go in that area. I think it would be wonderful, but I can't do it myself. So if anybody else is interested and has some sort of resources, capacity, time, energy, that would be wonderful to co-partner. I wanted to bring about the, uh, the reason why I uh, used the term magic. Magic uh -huh. because uh, about four or five years ago, I was doing a, uh, let's say, profile analysis of a competitor who was <laughs> disrupting my business and uh, oh. obviously a military guy has a lot of resources and this and that now once i kind of got into a quasi meditative state you know the thing that i've said uh you know his posting was in egypt as a military attache and i said mm -hmm. wow i bet uh, the egyptian military may have even promised him a burial site in the king of valleys or something because <laughs> there are things you can read uh, about the individual and sure enough, six months, seven months later, I see a phony website on Eastern Mediterranean oil, and he has been wow. put in as a key, <laughs> key wow. person. So he has no yes. affiliation in the oil business or <laughs> yes. its uh, political aspects. And when I did the forensics on the website, it was a website out of Egypt, Giza, but no further details over. Thank so thank you very much. But thank you, Bessie. I think that is a huge problem. I mean, huge issue. Um, Yelena Mizukina mentioned about marketing. Yes, some people are very good at self-promotion and marketing. They have certain skills. They have certain backgrounds that allow for this. And, uh, you know, there is a, a, a particular game being played out there as well. Uh, also, we do know that futures kind of came out of in... in I mean, one of the influences, there they was a tradition of social utopianism from Europe of, you know, 17th, 18th century, 19th century, all that sort of stuff. There was tradition from Plato in Western civilization, imagining different societies that are better, Plato, Aristotle, they all wrote about that, Middle Ages, uh, Utopia book uh, by Moore was there. So there is that tradition, but then there is a tradition from um, US, which was coming from military sector and corporate sector. And that one was dominant for a while. And then in 1960s, futures thinking started being more democratized through you know, the impact of social movements. And those social movements wanted different future. They wanted different futures. And they started democratizing futures thinking as well. That's the tradition I personally come from. So we need to democratize it even more, I think, because uh, you know it was very much Western-based. And uh, now I've been privileged to work in many parts of Asia. And I always find it so wonderful because I can learn so much. Obviously, my learning always goes through my gaze. 
uh, my social, cultural, historical, but I do my best to expose myself to different worldviews, not just an experiences that are external, but to see the perception of the same thing from very different worldview and perspective. And this is what democratizing futures thinking is also about. So thank you for your comment, Bessir. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we don't, if we don't have any more um, questions or comments from everybody who has been here, uh, we'd like to thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and thank you so much to Dr. Ivana for sharing with us more about your work. Um, I just ordered my copies. <laughs> oh, thank you so, so I, I look so forward to reading you. them and maybe sending That's my little sorry. cousin a copy. I hope you do come out with uh, stories for young boys in the future because some, sometimes they're left behind. Definitely. I mean, there is a whole field of critical masculinity studies that is not anti-feminist, like some people who engage in post-feminism argue. It's actually post-feminist in a real way uh, that it engages with feminism. And then it says, okay, now we engage with feminism. What does this mean for boys? And we know how much boys suffer from yes. not being allowed to express the full range of their emotions, being forced to go into aggression and rage, being violent subjects and objects. Uh, so that is also very prevalent. And we know that women, if we follow the work of uh, Nesbitt and Aberdeen, for example, they talked about how with all these changes, women managed to adjust more so because mainstream society values masculine traits. So women were better able to embrace both in the course of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, but men are usually punished for embracing feminine traits and thus that whole full human experience is often missing. And sometimes it's very harmful for young um, men and boys. I actually have a book, um, not, not a book, I have an article in Johann Galtung's book on uh, masculinities and um, traditional versus alternative ones. And uh, why I believe alternative ones are better, <laughs> less harmful and how traditional ones. You can go on metafuture.org and find all those articles available for free. Uh, and also, I wherever they're published. Usually we try to go with open source wherever we can. Yeah, so that's my comment and yeah, definitely. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, Sonia, yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, well, Brothers Green, you know, they became the canon, but they were also particular persons in a particular time in history, in a particular place. Why and how they became the dominant narrative is very surprising. I mean, it's puzzling. It's actually fascinating. Uh, and I think it has something to do with us liking something solid. That's why we like to hold on to those narratives from the past, because they seem more real than the new ones. They may, uh, feel more solid because they've been around for a while. That's kind of my understanding from, psycho from studies in psychology and also my own investigation into human condition, including my own. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for everybody staying here, being here, uh, to those that have to leave. Uh, thank you for being here with us. And uh, thank you for everybody who is watching this recorded. I hope to hear from some of you um, or not. It's uh, whatever. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it would be nice to stay connected and keep on talking and developing some of these initiatives and let me know if I can help in any way with things that you are working on. So that's from me. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole, for running this, organizing it. I really appreciate it and uh, hope to see you soon.